All right, we're going to go ahead and call the June 16th Planning and Zoning Commission meeting to order. And I will open up my notes here and we'll get started. If I can find them, I had them open. Here we go. All right, um, let's go ahead and do a roll call. Chairman Lindblom. I am here. Vice Chair Slasher. Commissioner Arnett. Here. Commissioner Swart. Here. Commissioner Lawrence. Here. Commissioner McGee. Here. Commissioner Hernandez. Here. Commissioner Montoya. Here. Commissioner Dan Zeisen. Chairman, we do have a quorum. Perfect. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and read these announcements that this meeting has been noticed in accordance with open meeting laws. Uh, Arizona Revised Statute Section 38-431. Agendas are available within 24 hours of each meeting in the Maricopa County Planning and Development Office. And are also available on the Planning and Development website one week prior to the hearing at maricopa.gov backslash planning. The staff reports are prepared each agenda. The staff reports prepared for each agenda item shall become part of the permanent record for each case. And with respect to the hearing process, cases will be considered in the order they appear on the agenda unless otherwise agreed to by the commission. For each case, the applicant will be given a set amount of time to present. Anyone wishing to speak on a particular item can, uh, on a particular case, shall fill out a speaker's card for in-person attendance or raise your hand within the GoToWebinar. I have a couple that have been filled out today. and. You're here and haven't filled that one wish to speak. If you're not the applicant, please do so. The amount of time allowed for speaking shall be at the discretion of the commission chair and staff will provide the chairman with the names of, each, of persons who have registered and, and noted desire to comment and those registered participants who have raised their hand. The chairman will call on each name participant one at a time. Man, I'm, I, this is long when you're out of shape. And the chairman will conduct the hybrid in person and virtual public hearing according to the bylaws and according to the rules established by the chairman regarding public comment. Votes will be done by a roll call vote only, and the chairman will verbally identify the specific members responsible for all motions and seconds. So, getting all that legal stuff out of the way, we're glad you're here and look forward to hearing from each of you. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, present the minutes for May 12, 2022. If there's any comments from the commission, please let those know now. Hearing none, we'll go ahead and approve those. And we'll uh, move into the continuance um, portion of our agenda. Do we have any continuance items? Yes, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, commissioners. The Z2021-133, known as Val Vista 1 in District 1, uh, which is a C2 CPD rezone, is to be continued to July 7th. And Z2021-162, known as Brown Family Project, also in District 1, a C2 CUPD rezone, is to be continued to August 4th. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, no, item, no action items for that at this time. We'll go ahead and continue those items. Um, moving into our consent um, agenda um, order, uh, I believe there were some comments by, well, are there any, before we jump into that, are there any comments that need to be made on consent? I think Commissioner Montoya mentioned earlier that there were. Mr. Yeah, Chairman. I have Go ahead. Go, uh, hold on just a second, Commissioner Montoya. Go ahead and. Uh, I believe Commissioner Montoya had some questions. I didn't know if you wanted me to give a quick presentation. And yeah, yeah, why, why don't, don't we do that? that? Why, why don't, don't you jump through those and then we'll we'll address them as we need to. Okay. There are seven items on consent. Quickly, they are um, S2021-035, known as Sunset Ridge in District 5. This is a 354-lot preliminary plat in the R5 zoning district on 70. 
4.6 acres at the southwest corner of Broadway and 83rd Avenue. There's no known opposition in paragraph 11, the recommendations for approval subject to conditions A through L. D2022-047, known as Crown 826829 Menshaw in District 4, it's a special use permit for a wireless communication facility in the Rural 43 Zoning District, specifically to add an additional 25 years to the validity period. This is on a 1,350-acre lease site northwest of the northwest corner of Citrus and Harrison Street. Again, no known opposition, recommendations for approval, subject to conditions A through I in paragraph 17. Z2022-049, known as Castle Hot Spring, Morristown, WCF, and District 4, is um, a special use permit modification conditions for an additional 25-year validity period. This is um, in the Rural 43 WHSC Zoning District. That means the Wickenburg Highway Center Corridor. It's a one-acre site northwest of the northwest corner of Gates Road in US 60. Known on opposition in paragraph 11, the recommendations for approval subject conditions A through F. Z2022-050, known as Crown Castle, 879-296 Snow, District 4, is also a modification of conditions of a special use permit uh, for an additional 25-year validity period for a wireless communication facility in the rural 190 zoning district on approximately 2,500-acre lease site south of the southeast corner of State Route 74 and 211th Avenue in Morristown. There's no known opposition. The recommendations for approval, subject to conditions A through F in paragraph 11. Z2022-059, known as Creamland Dairy East Digital Billboard in District 1, is a special use permit to convert a legal nonconforming static billboard to a digital face on a one plus acre site west of the southwest corner of Loop 202 and McQueen Road. There's no known opposition. The recommendation in paragraph 10 is for approval, subject to conditions A through E. Z2022-027, known as the Enclave at Anthem in District 3, it's a special use permit major amendment uh, to add uh, 10 additional row home casitas to a, um, a, a residential facility in the CO SUP zoning district on a 1.4 acre site, the southwest corner of Anthem Way and Venture Drive. There's no known opposition. The recommendation in paragraph 17 is for approval, subject to conditions A through G. And finally, MCP 2022-001, known as RV Storage Dysart in District 4, it's a military compatibility permit with a plan of development for an RV and boat storage facility on a 35.4 acre site in the Rural 43 MAAMF Zoning District, in the southwest corner of Olive and Dysart. There's no known opposition in paragraph 18, the recommendations for approval, subject conditions A through F. Happy to answer any questions. I'm going to turn my mic on. You, you did, did that a lot better than I did. I want you to run a few laps around the building and then we'll see how you do. I'll, yeah. I'll speed walk it. <laughs> All right. Having, uh, thank you for that presentation. Uh, is there any comments at this time from the commission on these consent agenda items? Commissioner Montoya, did you have any? Yeah, I have a couple of questions on okay. um, case number S2021035 Sunset Ridge. Uh, wanted to know um, what is the time frame for phase one and phase two? Okay, um, if, if uh, under this, would we need to just pull this off consent to address that question? Or do you know that time frame, Mr. Gerard? I believe, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, Commissioner Montoya, uh, I believe uh, that we are going, it's possible we are going to see um, them develop concurrent. Uh, the, the preliminary plan is valid for a two year period. It can be extended uh, for an additional year. Uh, and then uh, if that first phase is developed, then there will be an additional two year validity period for the second phase. Uh, but it could be that both phases come in concurrent at the same time. Does that satisfy your question? Uh, yes, and then I have two more questions very quickly. Um, I wanted to know about the 83rd uh, realignment, and is that in phase two or in phase one? Sorry, I'm, I'm, I, I am having to look, but I believe that in phase one. 
And um, last question is, um, there's mention of a tra uh, traffic control signal. Will that include a left turn lane? Commissioner Matoya, I, if there's a signal, it certainly will be full turn movements. Okay, thank you. That's all. Thank you, Commissioner Montoya. Uh, any other questions, questions or if no, not, I'll propose a motion. Entertain a motion, sorry, I'll propose one. Mr. Chairman, this is Commissioner McGee. Go ahead, Commissioner McGee. I'm gonna give it a try. I, I move approval of consent agenda items one through nine as it would be, uh, it, sorry to interrupt you it would be item number three would be your item start number three as presented i'm sorry but we didn't have to pull it off no, no problem. problem yeah it's three through nine i'm sorry i move uh, approval of consent agenda items three through nine as presented thank, thank you commissioner, commissioner we, we have, have a motion, motion. uh commissioner short did i see you second, second that, that? Uh, you're, you're on mute. mute. Can you just unmute and say that? Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. We have a second com from Commissioner Swart. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. Commissioner Lawrence. Approve. Commissioner McGee. Uh, yes. Commissioner Swart. Yes. Commissioner Arnett. Yes. Commissioner Hernandez. Yes. Commissioner Montoya? Yes. Chairman Lindblom? Yes. Chairman, that's an approval of the consent agenda by a vote of seven to zero. All right, with a vote of seven to zero, we will approve those consent items and we'll move on to our regular agenda items. Those that came for those consents, thank you for being here. You're welcome to go get on to your business other places. Thank you for being patient with me today. Appreciate it. All right, All right, we'll, we'll jump, jump into, into um, regular agenda, agenda order item number 10, 10 CPA 2022 004. Um, I believe Mr. Ray, you're going to, Mr. Ray Bank, is going to present that. Yes, good morning, uh, Chairman Lindblom and members of the commission. We're actually going to do a presentation for the next uh, five items. So thank you. Uh, today we'll be discussing items number uh, 10 to 14 of the agenda. Uh, which are staff's proposals to decommission uh, five area plans, and I'll read these uh, cases for the record. So it'll be CPA 2022-004, the Levine Area Plan. Uh, we also have CPA 2022-005, the Estrella Area Plan, CPA 2022-006, the Mobile Area Plan, CPA 2022-007, the East, Mary East Mesa Area Plan, and the finally the CPA uh, 2022 -008 Queen Creek area plan. So those five we'll all do in this presentation today. Um, I'll change the slide here. Great. So this is the uh, map of the current area plan boundaries and locations within the county. Um, there are 13 active area plans right now. So we're just going to discuss five of those today. Uh, we can refer this map, you know, throughout this presentation if, if needed. And so an introduction uh, to this I actually did a presentation in front of you all uh, last August in the Zipper uh, committee meeting uh, where we presented all the uh, current area plan analysis and research that we did. Um, this research established uh, several criteria uh, with which staff evaluated the status of each area plan, uh, which included how much of each area plan has been annexed into you know, municipalities. Uh, we also uh, looked at how much uh, CPAs and DMPs were approved so pretty much uh, large scale requests for changes within you know a 10 year period. Um, also uh, growth potential and unique factors within each area plan. And then finally, uh, the easiest for us to identify was uh, how old you know each of these plans are and their most recent updates. So uh, those are kind of the four criteria we looked at when we were doing that study. Uh, our general findings that we found uh, were that uh, five of these uh, area plans, which is the subject of today, uh, we're very outdated uh, with the latest update, you know, adopted and or happened 30 years ago, at least. And because of that, uh, these plans do not represent uh, the existing conditions of these areas. 
uh, given that 58 to 89 percent of these plan areas have since been annexed uh, into cities or towns, uh, you know, which we all know is happening. It continues to happen. Uh, that's not controlled by the county as far as annexation goes. So, um, so that's what um, our general findings were from that study research. Um, so this is um, the spreadsheet table that we came up with. Uh, we had that in our last presentation back in the zipper meeting. Uh, you're provided this as well in a memo handout that Darren sent out the other day. Um, and pretty much this table, we're gonna be focusing on those five highlighted plans in yellow there at the top. So we can refer to this uh, chart as, as needed, you know, throughout in this, and we'll go through each of these uh, area plan sum, you know, summaries for uh, each of these area plans for all those criteria on uh, these next few slides. Okay, so we're gonna start. Um, so first off, this is the Levine area plan uh, adopted back in 1992, has not been updated since. Uh, it encompasses about 27 square miles, uh, is a re is, but is already 70 to 71 percent annexed in the city of Phoenix, uh, with only approximately eight square miles left within county jurisdiction. Uh, what we see is mostly rural densities and open space, land use designation south of Dobbins Road, uh, as well as small lot residential near 67th Avenue and Baseline. Uh, but the remaining unincorporated land is mostly north of Southern uh, near the river. So where we see mostly open space industrial zoning um, as well as uh, related land uses existing today. So that's summary of uh, what's there in the Levine area plan. Um, also just Northwest of the Levine area plan is the uh, Estrella area plan. Um, we have, you know, the same adoption date as 1992, so 30 years ago, and also has not been updated since. Uh, this plan is approximately 25 square miles, approximately 60% has since been annexed into multiple jurisdictions. That includes Phoenix uh, to the east, Avondale to the west, and portions of Tolis to the, to the north. The major portion of this 10 square miles left in this plan um, is uh, along the southern portion of the plan boundary, and that's also adjacent to the Salt River, uh, just like in the Levine area plan. So these properties in that area are mostly open space, rural densities, including mostly vacant and undeveloped properties um, and agricultural uses otherwise. Okay, and moving on, we then see one of the most remote area plans in the county, uh, the Mobile uh, area plan. Uh, the southern portion of the county, which was adopted back in 1991, uh, already has approximately 90%, 89 or 90% of the total land area annexed in the city of Goodyear. It appears that a large amount of land was annexed in 2007 uh, for a master plan community, but that has never developed. So, you know, it's still within the uh, city's limits. Uh, however, this area has been known as an established African-American community for nearly 100 years. Uh, only four square miles remain within the county. And uh, this includes an approximately 1,000 acre landfill site, which is entitled to a special use permit. So not much other land otherwise in the county jurisdiction. Uh, so the next area plan we're gonna discuss is the, we're moving east now, is the East Mesa area plan, uh, also adopted back in 1992. So again, 30 years ago, uh, not been updated since. Uh, total of uh, 96 square miles within this plan area has been around, uh, or has seen around 58% of the land annexed in the city of Mesa jurisdiction for the portion of the Southwest area of the plan uh, within the town of Gilbert as well. So, but most of that plan area, the Northeast, if you can see that large area in white is the uh, Usury Mountain Regional Park. So that encompasses about 3,650 acres as well in the Northeast quadrant there. Um, and although, uh, you know, we see most of the activity from the Apache Trail area um, of the plan where there's still strip commercial zoning along the arterials. And al although, you know, 40, 40 square miles exist, again, that's a lot of it's a regional park as well. So, and then the last one we'll mention here, I can get the slide to change. Is the uh, Queen Creek uh, area plan also adopted back in 92. Uh, this plan includes several annexing municipalities, including Queen Creek, Mesa, Gilbert and Chandler. Uh, only around 14 square miles of this 92 
square mile area remains in the county jurisdiction. Uh, this equates to approximately 85% of the uh, plan area already incorporated. And uh, although there are portions along Santan Boulevard and Riggs Road that include commercial and residential land uses, and zoning in, uh, is still in the county jurisdiction, you know, there's been several projects recently that have been annexed as well. So, um, so that concludes, uh, you know, the five plans there that we are considering for decommission. So in conclusion with this uh, presentation today, um, so we identified these five plans of the 13 existing area plans within the county. Um, you know, we are basing this decommission off that criteria we established that we discussed uh, last year at the zipper meeting. Uh, these five plans haven't been updated or were adopted almost 30 years ago. We're uh, more than 58% and up to 89% of each plan area have been annexed to municipalities. Um, and also uh, there's have been minimal land use designation activity, meaning the lack of CPAs and DMPs in the last 10 years. Uh, these plans are decommissioned. Um, an important fact would be that the county jurisdiction properties within these areas or area plan boundaries would be changed to rural development area or RDA uh, with a density range of zero to one dwelling units per acre. Uh, and this is significant to note uh, given that uh, these unincorporated areas would remain with the lowest intensity and density land use designation, um, which, you know, if there are any proposed changes in the future, would require a public hearing process for requested changes uh, if there's zoning or land use proposals that uh, may not fit with an RDA land use designations uh, within that category. Uh, although uh, it should be noted that this will not affect uh, current zoning that's already been approved and on site. Uh, uh, lastly, uh, staff would also like to include in the future, next two to three years, a county island study with a future update to the conference of plan. Uh, this study would focus on the following. It would also include unincorporated areas within uh, lands within these uh, area plan boundaries. Uh, so we'd like to focus in the future on providing up-to-date information and existing conditions, uh, including utilities and services within these areas. We would uh, analyze uh, future development requests to understand what and if, or if anything is feasible uh, within existing land use or within existing county islands and how to encourage annexation when needed. Uh, we would set specific strategies and policies and goals uh, for different types, sizes, and locations of these county islands. And this will help uh, guide uh, proposals to viable development options if available on these areas. Uh, and lastly, it would help promote a conference approach to understanding the current state of these county islands and to outline uh, possible solutions to the future from a policy and guideline perspective. So again, that would be kind of wrapped in uh, with a conference of plan and uh, the study would include these areas as well. Um, and again, we don't believe that these uh, these um, area, plan, area plans uh, really represent these areas. Um, because of all the changes in the last 30 years. So, uh, so that concludes my presentation. Uh, appreciate your time today. Um, you know, if the commission would like to make a motion on any of these, uh, please do so separately because there are five different CPA cases. And with that being said, uh, we can answer any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions for staff at this time based on that presentation? I have I have one. Uh, so we're essentially decommissioning these existing plans. Uh, if I heard you right, the intent is to create some new plans that are more uh, up to date uh, at a future point. That's a like a more comprehensive plan. Is it your comprehensive plan? Is it a, a county as a whole or separate plans for these areas? Like what does that look like? Yes, Chairman Lindblom. Um, yeah, essentially, so we have a conference and plan update happening soon. Uh, so we'd wrap in a county island study within that conference and plan, which would not only include, you know, other areas of the county that are within county islands, but also these are all county islands as well because they're within future annexable areas of all these municipalities. So, um, so it would, it would, you know, we don't have the full details of it, but essentially, uh, we'd be. Uh, you know, making sure that we cover existing conditions as well as coming up with policy and, and goals that would be more representative of, of the specifics of these areas as well. So I don't know if you wanted to add to that, Aaron and Oller. Mr. Chairman, uh, we do not foresee new plans specific to these areas, okay. uh, but there may be policies that address these specific areas or areas of the county such as similar to these. Yeah, that makes sense. So. 
Well, the valley has certainly changed since 1990s, early 90s. So it makes sense to come up with a different way to address it, and especially with um, the percentage of annexation in a lot of these areas. You have a lot of little county islands all over, and so I, I get the point of having better information on what's still out there and how to address those um, as, as a whole for the county and, and that, and it sounds like that's what you're working towards doing. Uh, any other questions at this time from the commission? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Arnett. Just a clarification with staff. I uh, thank you. I mean, so much work goes into this and we, I know that was a quick summary, but thanks Ray, a lot of effort. Thanks for all the good work. But my, my question, we're, we're going from a decommissioning these plans to policies. If, if someone came to as a zoning case that was kind of contrary to those policies, if you would that be administrative? I guess it's just the zoning case. You know, in the past we've done uh, plan amendments. Give me an idea of what that looks like going forward for some of these islands that we're going to have these policies. Are they just guidelines? Like, is there any change in, it, or is it just a simple zoning case that there we don't need to? Obviously, we don't need to change policies. Does that question make sense? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner Arnett, this is Darren. Uh, same as today, if, if someone comes in with a uh, with any type of proposal and they require a, a change in zoning, we're going to review that against our comprehensive plan and any applicable land use plan for uh, compatibility and we review against the preponderance of goals and policies uh, to make sure that the preponderance of goals are met. Um, so that will be, th that will not change. That will still be the same. Uh, there will not be a specific land use plan uh, subject to most of these areas. If they weren't already subject of a CPA or DMP case in the past, there will be, uh, they will default to what's called rural development area. Um, which essentially requires uh, development to remain under one dwelling unit per acre. Uh, therefore, uh, any rezone in these areas uh, is likely to trigger uh, some type of comp plan amendment to go along as a companion to that rezone. And so those will be public notice, public hearings. Um, and that's the same uh, condition that exists in most of our counties. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Uh, go ahead, Commissioner McGee. Oh, uh, thank you, sir. Um, I really like the idea and granted, I'm still very new at this, but shifting from the plans to a county islands study, when will that be uh, completed and would it be across the county or or just simply these areas. Uh, I think that's a much more articulated approach as best as I understand it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McGee. Uh, Darren, did you wanna answer that? Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner McGee, uh, we'll likely uh, start studies as part of the conference plan update process over the next year, and then it'll be a couple of year process. So uh, one to three years. And Mr. Chairman and Darren, will we, would the commission be receiving updates or, I, I'm trying to figure out what the substitute review process would be. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner McGee, uh, yes, you will be involved in, uh, in the comprehensive plan. Uh, you will be presented drafts and, and be given regular updates, usually at our zipper work session meetings. Uh, but again, the review process for uh, development proposals within these geographic areas will be as they are for most of Maricopa County. Uh, you'll, you, you will still see uh, anything that requires a change in zoning entitlement, you see, and we will review that against the uh, existing policies and the comprehensive plan uh, to make sure our preponderance of those policies are furthered with the change. Um, and if not, you will see conference and plan amendments uh, companion to zoning cases. But that's the same thing that happens today. 
in most of Maricopa County. Um, there just will not be a specific land use plan for these areas. They will default to rural development area, which uh, is the default land use category for most of unincorporated county. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Commissioner McGee. Any other questions? All right. Um, I am thinking how to handle this. So this is on regular agenda item. Is there, um, I think for time purposes, we can continue to um, address these all together, even from the general body. Um, well, we can open up to public comment, uh, and uh, if there is a need to get very specific, we can, and I'll make that decision at that point. But is there anyone from the public that has presented themselves as, as liking to speak on this these proposed changes? Staff, you aware of anybody? Anybody here? All right, that made that part easy. Um, all right, well, uh, we do need to address each of these individually, so let's go ahead and um, I would be willing to entertain motions. Uh, let's, uh, for me just to keep my head straight, uh, we could start with item number 10, CPA 2022-004, the Levine Area Plan. Is there anyone uh, will need to make a discussion or willing to make a motion at this time? Mr. Yeah, Chairman. I heard a couple, so um, uh, for, I'll start this way. Any comments first, or are we? I did. Okay. I'm ready to make a motion. Okay, okay. was that Commissioner Montoya? Correct. All right, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, I uh, make a motion on that we approve uh, CPA 2022-004 to decommission the Levine Area Plan. I'll second. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Montoya. Do we have a second? I'll second the motion. Thank you, Commissioner Swart. Commissioner Swart has seconded that. Let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. Commissioner Lawrence. Approved. Commissioner McGee. Yes. Commissioner Swart. Yes. Commissioner Arnett? Yes. Commissioner Hernandez? Yes. Commissioner Montoya? Yes. Chairman Lindblom? Yes. Chairman, that's an approval by a vote of seven to zero. Thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda item number 12, CPA 2022-006, the mobile, mobile area plan. Do we have any comments or someone willing to make a motion? Chairman, this is Commissioner Hernandez. I think we skipped CPA 2022-005, but I would uh, make a motion to approve CPA 2022-005, the Australia area plan uh, to decommission that as presented. I yeah. second that motion. Thanks for catching that. So, um, yeah, number for clarity, number 11, CPA 2022-005, Estrella area plan. We have um, a motion from Chair, Commissioner Hernandez and a second, Mr. Montoya. Uh, any, um, we'll go ahead and take a vote if there's not. I didn't, I want to make sure there aren't any comments for, uh, or as well, but hearing none, we'll, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote on that. Commissioner Lawrence. Approved. Commissioner McGee. Yes. Commissioner Swart. Yes. Commissioner Arnett. Yes. Commissioner Hernandez. Yes. Commissioner Montoya. Yes. Chairman Limblum. Yes. Chairman, that's an approval by a vote of seven to zero. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez, for catching that. Uh, item number 12, CPA 2022-006, uh, Mobile Area Plan. Any comments or motion at this time? I'd like to make a motion uh, to approve CPA 
0.006 to decommission the mobile area plan. Thank you. We have a motion by Commissioner uh, Montoya. Did I hear a second by Commissioner Swart? Yes. All right, and a second by Commissioner Swart. I'll do a roll, roll call vote, Rosalie. Commissioner Lawrence? Yes. Commissioner McGee? Yes. Commissioner Swart? Yes. Commissioner Arnett? Yes. Commissioner Hernandez? Yes. Commissioner Montoya? Yes. Chairman Limblum? Yes. Chairman, that's an approval by a vote of seven to zero. Perfect. Moving on to agenda item number 13, CPA 2022-007, the East Mesa Area Plan. Any comments or a motion? I'll make a motion to approve that. Uh, agenda item number 13. All right, so we have a motion to approve CPA 2022-007 East Mesa Area Plan by Commissioner Arnett. Do we have a second? This is Commissioner Hernandez, I'll second that. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez, who seconded that. Let's go ahead and do a roll call vote. Commissioner Lawrence? Yes. Commissioner McGee? Yes. Commissioner Swart? Yes. Commissioner Arnett? Yes. Commissioner Hernandez? Yes. Commissioner Montoya? Yes. Chairman Limblum? Yes. Chairman, that's an approval by a vote of seven to zero. Great, thank you. Uh, moving on to agenda order, uh, agenda item number 14, CPA 2022-008, the Queen Creek area plan. Do we have a motion or um, or uh, comments? This is my district. I'm happy to make that motion. I'll make the motion to approve CPA 2022-008. I'll second that, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Swart. Do roll call vote. Commissioner Lawrence. Yes. Commissioner McGee. Yes. Commissioner Swart. Yes. Commissioner Arnett. Yes. Commissioner Hernandez? Yes. Commissioner Montoya? Commissioner Montoya? Yes. Chairman Lindblom? Yes. Chairman, that's an approval by a vote of seven to zero. All right, thank you. And thank you to staff for working hard on these types of issues to keep our county current and moving forward. Thank you, Ray, for all your work on that and everybody. All right, we'll move on to um, agenda item number 15, uh, Z2021-150, the Desert Hills RV and boat storage. Um, we'll have a presentation by staff at this time. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, commissioners. C-2021-150, known as Desert Hills RV and Boat Storage Facility in District 3, is a special use permit for commercial storage of RVs, boats, and vehicles in the Rural 43 Zoning District on a 4.7-acre site at the northeast corner of Carefree Highway and Central Avenue. The proposal includes 88 uncovered spaces surrounded by an 8-foot solid wall. Access will be off of Central, uh, which will have an 8-foot high uh, sign uh, approximate to the driveway. There will be a five foot strip of uh, natural desert landscaping along Carefree Highway, um, which is minimal requirement in keeping with the uh, scenic corridor. There is one letter of opposition, uh, general concern, uh, but the New River Desert Hills Community Association uh, has uh, had concerns that have all been addressed in the proposed site plan. And the county's area plan designates the site for commercial uses. Therefore, the recommendation Paragraph 16 is for approval subject to conditions A through L. I'm happy to try and answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Oops. Thank you for that. Um, any uh, 
questions for staff at this time? Mr. Chairman, uh, this go ahead. is um, the letter of opposition. It, it seems more generalized as opposed to directed at this facility um, related to additional traffic development, et cetera, in the area. At least that's how I perceive it. How have those requests been handled? Uh, are they are they going to at some point install traffic signal, pave? Um, I mean, it, some of it's just outside the purview of of development, so to speak, or our our commission. So I'm trying to figure out where those requests uh, wind up and how are they being treated? Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner McGee, yes, yeah, staff took that as a just a general opposition to development in the area. Uh, but in specific regard to this case, uh, you know, the applicants submit drainage reports and transportation uh, impact reports. And uh, in this instance, they're going to have, they're going to pave their access uh, within the right of way, the improvements on Central Avenue and Carefree that exist today are sufficient to accommodate this this facility. Um, improvements are done based upon uh, traffic generated by a project at the time that that development occurs, and that's based upon the uh, engineered uh, traffic studies that are reviewed by uh, uh, that discipline here in the county. And I hope that answers your question. Sir, it does. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McGee. Any other questions? Hearing none, we'll allow the applicant to speak if they'd like to present on it. Oh, hello. This is Troy Burleson presenting on behalf of the Desert Hills Boat and RV Storage. Great. Um, Glad to have you here today. We uh, we tried to address this guy's the, the opposition's comments, and I kind of think they're a little bit self-serving because he runs a, or he lives a couple, couple lots away, and he runs like a, a, a dancing venue with an open bar at his at his house. So I think, I think I think those those concerns were a little bit self-serving, not specific to the site. All right. Um, would, would you, you like, like to present, present anything, anything else on your, your case? Thanks for you know, noting your your thoughts on that. that. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about on the project no, at this time? No, it's pretty pretty cut and dry. Pretty simple. I think you guys did a great presentation. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Um, for for that. Well, um, is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on this um, case here in person? I don't see any. Is there any online? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Swart, go ahead. I have no idea who this gentleman is. Is he an attorney? Is a consultant? Is he the property owner? I don't know anything uh, as a yeah, reference. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Swart. Um, the gentleman that just spoke, could you state your name and um, address and where, where uh, how, how you're related to the project? Yeah, I'm I sorry. Ask, I thought that I usually ask that and I forgot. I apologize. I apologize. I thought that was already on there. Um, I'm the property owner. My name is okay. Troy Burleson. Okay. Um, there's two. There's two owners. I'm one of two. Thank you for clarifying that. Any other questions at this time, Commissioner Short? Chairman okay. Lindblom, we're not aware of any others from the virtual side that want to speak. Okay. Perfect. Well, then um, we'll go ahead and close the. Are there uh, any other questions by the commission for the applicant? Hearing none, we'll close uh, public comment and um, we'll uh, we can speak about this amongst ourselves or I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Swart. I'll make a motion for item 15 for approval as right. the staff's previous stipulations. 
Okay. okay. We, we have, have a motion for, for approval from Commissioner Swart for item Z 2021-150 Desert Hills RV and boat storage as presented by staff. I got your motion correct. Um, do we have a second? Mr. Chairman, I was going to make the motion, but I will second. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, Commissioner you. McGee. We have a, a, a strong second, we'll, we'll call it. So, um, all right. Well, let's do a roll call vote. Commissioner Lawrence. Yes. Commissioner McGee. Yes. Commissioner Schwartz. Yes. Commissioner Arnett. Yes. Commissioner Hernandez. Yes. Commissioner Montoya. Yes. Chairman Lindblom. Yes. Chairman, that's an approval by a vote of seven to zero. Thank you, uh, Rosalie. All, All right, right let's, let's move, move on, on to agenda, agenda uh, item number, number 16, Z2021-127. This, this spawn residence, residence, if I'm saying that right. And we'll go, have, go ahead and have a presentation by staff at this time. Yes, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, Z2021-127, this spawn residence is in District 3. It's a special use permit for a cottage industry. Uh, a granite countertop cutting business in the Rural 43 Zoning District on a 1.6 acre site north of the northeast corner of Irvine and 15th Avenue in the Desert Hills area. Uh, the proposal includes the uh, storage of granite and quartz slabs, cutting and polishing and polishing of same. Uh, site screening would be a six foot CMU wall surrounding the uh, yard. The uh, newer, Daisy Mountain Newer Area Plan designates this area for rural densities of up to one dwelling per acre. There is significant opposition as of today's handout. You have 35 pieces of opposition, nine properties within 300 feet. Staff's not aware of any project support uh, recommendations for denial. Uh, this is an industrial operation surrounded by single family residences on one acre lots. Um, in addition to the sound generated by the stone cutting, they're operating off a generator in a shop, uh, in a shop building that was permitted as residential garage for storage uh, without utilities or electric. You can see in paragraph 12 uh, regarding opposition concerns, and those uh, are fairly numerous. Again, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I said paragraph 12. Uh, I'll read those. Uh, paragraph 12 on page 9 and 15 of your report. And again, this is the, this is the gist of the uh, neighborhood concerns. Excessive noise, humming, and vibration associated with the generator and material handling activities. Frequent semi-truck traffic, including horn honking, reverse gear alarms, and backing into 15th Avenue from the subject property. Silica dust exposure to workers and neighbors. Excessive water use. Noise from scrap material being dropped into dumpster. Possible occupation of an RV on the property. The neighbors indicate the wall has been increased to a height of eight feet with blacktop pavement without permits. Um, the granite materials are unloaded by use of crane and forklifts. Public safety is a concern related to the trucks entering and exiting the facility. Traffic is blocked when semi-trucks are backing into the facility. 15th Avenue is not designated for this type of heavy industrial traffic. There are school-aged children that have to walk across the street, which puts them at risk. There's excessive smell related to the loud unloading um, of materials uh, from the diesel trucks with uh, engines running. Uh, the diesel generator runs eight to nine hours a day, emits fumes, and there are additional chemicals utilized. Uh, foam sheets are used to protect the stones, which usually get blown by the wind and end up in adjacent yards and throughout the neighborhood. Um, the neighbors have also stated the subject property is on a shared well, not City of Phoenix water, as indicated by the applicant. Uh, the New River Desert Hills Community Association issued a letter uh, stating these similar concerns. Uh, outstanding review agencies uh, have con there are outstanding concerns from county review agencies. No county review agency has signed off on approval for this request. Um, engineering has indicated the applicants not submitted the required grading and drainage plan. Uh, environmental services um, references the discrepancy by the applicant sitting water service to be provided by City of Phoenix and sewer by an unknown provider, uh, whereas the site is on a shared well and uh, and the only wastewater available to the site would have to be on-site uh, septic system. The uh, Daisy Mountain Fire Department has uh, not received any contact from Exquisite Stone for fire coverage. They have indicated that an operation permit and fire life safety inspections would be required. 
essentially, uh, as uh, you know, the analysis, staff analysis beginning in paragraph 18, but uh, and, and runs for a couple of pages. But essentially, this appears to be a very intense industrial use that does not fit within the low intensity rural neighborhood land use patterns. The owner continues to operate the business in violation of the county zoning ordinance. There's a verified zoning violation on the property. The hearing officer established a deadline of October, of, I'm sorry, of August 17th, 2022, to obtain a special use permit approval from the Board of Supervisors or to cease and desist the use. Um, beginning in, in, in paragraph 24, staff lists um, 32 reasons for denying this SUP request. Um, and I'll read those into the record. Uh, Reviewing county agencies, which include planning, engineering, environmental services, have all have objections that are outstanding in this application. This appears to be a commercial industrial use framed as a home occupation in a low density rural residential area. The owner continues to operate the business in violation of the zoning ordinance without obtaining entitlement. The owner has made no attempt to work with the neighbors to cease to assist operation of the business until determination is made on the SUP. The use is too intense, arguably, for a cottage industry. Again, it is uh, more of a Rather than a home-based business, it appears to be a business that may have someone living at it. The, uh, due to the number of delivery trucks, operation of the business, manufacturing, waste disposal, cutting and sawing stone, using an on-site generator, the use is associated with an industrial zoning district comparable to industrial two zoning, not rule 43 zoning. The zoning ordinance defines rule 43 to conserve and protect farms and other open land uses, foster orderly growth in rural areas, prevent urban and agricultural land use complex and encourage sustainable development. Staff does not believe this furthers that goal. Staff is not able to confirm the owner resides on site, which is a cottage industry prerequisite. Uh, it's unclear on the number of deliveries per week and times for deliveries, number of projects being worked on per day, et cetera. Uh, the hours of operation and days of operation are not identified. Waste disposal and water filtration system is not clearly addressed. There's no discussion on the chemicals and materials being used in the operations on site. Uh, the uh, excess waste and roll off dumpster, uh, how many times is this cleared from the property uh, on a regular basis? Uh, additional on site improvements without obtaining permitting, such as the increase to the CME walls. And the wooden pallets, uh, and I, I apologize, there's, some of these are phrases rather than complete sentences, but there are wooden pallets to screen the southern region of the site rather than the CME wall is what I'm reading. There's an on, RV on site. The application does not address if there's someone residing on site, but there are claims that there are uh, occupied, uh, occupied RV and or trailer. Um, the additional right-of-way dedication would be required along 15th Avenue. The site plan does not account for future MGOT right-of-way uh, for this midsection alignment. The Arizona Registrar of Contractors identify two licenses with physical address of the subject site. Staff finds the intensity of the business activities are incompatible with the existing land use patterns, even if the generator is replaced with a higher amperage electrical service panel. The existing use is industrial nature does not meet the SP standards for business that's compatible in Rule 43. The application is also deficient in grading drainage plans, retention plans, existing water wastewater service explanation. The public opposition to the request due to the ongoing granite shop operations and excessive noise and impacts to the residents is significant and it seems to constitute. Uh, the vast majority of the neighborhood. There's opposition from the New River Desert Hills Community Association, the local community group. Uh, the narrative and site plan discrepancies um, remain with explaining business operation, identifying structures on site. The potential for water use not established with the well water agreement with the neighbors is uh, remains a concern. There's discrepancies with utility services for water and wastewater. Grading drainage plans not submitted. Uh, with three different iterations uh, of application for review. Aerial imagery of the site shows the servants exceeds 1,500 square feet that requires engineered plans for review and identify parking, driveways, and retention basins. Daisy Mountain Fire has not received any contract for fire coverage and permitting. The midsection alignment would require 40 foot half width dedication. Site plan does not account for future right away. Uh, the staff's not able to confirm existing uses with uh, conform with the regulations outlined in chapter 13. Uh, for special uses. Uh, the site is non-compliant at present with the zoning ordinance. Uh, again, there's unlawful use of the land occurring at present. The existing industrial use is not suitable. In the existing rural zone community with single family residential housing, the use has resulted in the direct impact to the neighbors in the rural community as a nuisance with noise, dust, and traffic. 
use as an industrial use that should be established within industrial zone district, not within Rural 43 as the cottage industry home-based SUP. The use does not protect the character of the rural community, does not promote peace, safety, and welfare as defined in the purpose statement of the zoning ordinance in general. Uh, for that reason, for all those reasons, the recommendation of paragraph 25 is to deny Z2021-127. Further, in paragraph 26, you'll note that if the commission considers a motion for approval, you will need to formulate conditions. Staff is unable to even offer conditions at this point because no review in the HCS signed off on the proposal. It uh, remains administratively incomplete. Um, it is being processed because of lack of progress and um, if this case is disposed of through the board, uh, staff will just continue pursuing code enforcement based upon the hearing officer's judgment. Now, I'm happy to try and answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Darren. <laughs> we'll call you Darren today. Um, is the applicant uh, here today or online? You are? Would you like to speak? Yes. Can you all hear me? I, uh, is it who's gonna would uh, so I have somebody online it sounds like and I have somebody here in person. Um, who, who's online right now or or? Uh... Well, uh, the person online is Daniel Estrate. Uh, I am the architect on the project. Uh, Daniel Estrate with Contexture. Uh, address is three three four North Twentieth Street, uh, Phoenix, Arizona eight five zero one six. I'm the applicant and the architect. The person in presence is the owner. I have him there in case uh, we have any additional questions for the owner. So the owner is in the audience. Uh, we couldn't make it in person, so I had to call uh, and, and uh, virtually for the meeting. So uh, as mentioned, I was the applicant. And uh, uh, good morning, everybody. I'll give a, a quick um, a presentation and address some of the items brought up by uh, both the, uh, the letter, uh, letters of opposition, uh, describe a little bit about the process and also the points brought up by the by the county official. Um, I think there were, um, so when the owner bought the property, I would like to state that the existing um, shed that there's, is being used was there on the property. Uh, it wasn't built by the owner, it was there somebody was operating that as a um, as a shop uh, to fix cars i believe before so when the owner moved in there uh, they looked in the county's rule and regulation and there were no exceptions sta uh, stating that you cannot use um, that a granite shop was not one of the permitted uses so i just wanted to stand that uh, state that the applicant uh, the owner who is in the audience and i'll let him identify himself if need be does live on the property and so does his daughter. Uh, so uh, the county making statements that they don't know who occupies the property, that's incorrect because at every time we made a submittal, we made it very clear that the owner lives on the property, his daughter lives there and her son-in-law. Uh, and this is a family owned and family run business. There's only three employees, is the the father, uh, the, uh, he, the son works for him and the son-in-law works for him. So it's, they, there aren't any employees that drive into work. It's the, again, the husband with the two. So there's a total of three people that work in that building, hardly a industrial uh, operation by any standard when you have three people working uh, um, on it. Uh, uh, there is a day, the way the, pro the project started was they were trying to actually get power from uh, from the power company, so they wouldn't have, obviously it's not an efficient way to run a business on a generator. They were trying to get power, and then the uh, power company told them you need to get a permit. So then th when they apply for the permit, is when, when they were told that they uh, they, uh, they need to get a special use permit. Uh, I also wanted to, since that was the num one of the number one complaints was running the generator, their intent was never to uh, run the generator full time, the intent was once we have a special use permit, we'll apply for an actual building permit and that will allow them to uh, to get a power upgrade. In the meantime, for the past two weeks, and I think the owner in, uh, in the audience has the paperwork, uh, he was able to actually uh, modify and install a motor inside the facility so the generator hasn't been in use and is no longer being in use, which was one of the concerns. Uh, one of the other concerns was also with silica dust. Um, I want to let the board know and any of the 
which we've already let all the neighbors know before. If anybody wants to go and see or has ever been inside of a, a shop, uh, the granite is cut with a water jet uh, cut, so it's not a it's not a dry cut that um, uh, emits dust. It's if anybody's familiar with water jet, it's just water pressure, and basically the dust gets uh, it, it doesn't get pulverized, and it basically just turns into the uh, into the it gets combined with the water, so it's not a fine dust as as described. I would I would venture to say that. All the host properties around it emit way more dust than any of the of the cutting. Just want to stay that. Um, and then, as far as the uh, as far as the uh, deliveries, they um, they get deliveries once a month or every two months, where they just unload them uh, uh, unload them with forklift, not the cranes, with forklift into uh, into pallets, and then some of them just get shipped direct. Uh, most of them actually, when they come in. They've already been pre-cut and they're being delivered to a job. They just need to be put on smaller trucks to take into uh, uh, take into uh, whatever jobs they're being uh, they're being installed. So the uh, as mentioning, it's run by three people: the the father with uh, his, the son and the son-in-law. Uh, they're no longer using the generator. They've installed a motor to operate the machine. The machine uses water to cut the granite. Um, which also mediates the, uh, uh, any dust. And then another thing to mention is there's two different procedures that I, I hope uh, the, the, the board understands. When you first use, uh, uh, when working on the application, they were given us a, a list of required uh, information and paperwork to, uh, to submit. Uh, you first need to get a special use permit uh, 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 approved, and then once that gets approved, you then actually submit construction documents. Those construction documents are the ones that will include information on grading and drainage and all the rest of it. But also, as a side note, uh, to include information on grading and drainage on a property that's existing, the building that they're operating in is existing. So no work was done on the uh, no work was done on the property. Uh, although we will submit a grading and drainage uh, plan, but no work has been done on it to garner a grading and drainage. If all the buildings are existing and everything, we uh, we can go look back as uh, before the owner bought the property that there were no there were no changes done to it. As so, whoever installed uh, whoever built that building, they built it with the with the permit. I think back in 2019. Which was before the owner, uh, the owner purchased the the property. Uh, so um, with that, I'll open it to any questions from uh, uh, any of the board members. Thank thank you for that presentation. Um, I, I have some questions. I'll I'll hold for a minute um, with mine. Are there any comments or questions from those on the commission? at this time. Okay. Um, so in these types of scenarios, um, we're talking about people's livelihoods and um, government has to find like the right balance, right? And um, how the use of one property owner infringes on another. And so when I look at these in my head, I, I try to make that balance. One of the challenges I'm having right now is as I listened to the staff report, it almost felt like there ha and Darren, maybe you can um, enlighten me on this. Has there not been a lot of interaction between the applicant and the county? Because there was, uh, and the reason I asked that question, it's uh, we're unable to determine whether someone lives in the home, those, those types of things. Like there was a lot of that kind of, um, those kind of comments within the report. Yes, Mr. Chairman, there has uh, there has been a lot of okay. dialogue back and forth and, okay. and iterations. Uh, staff has, believes we have not received information that allows us to uh, come up with alternative stipulations for approval. But uh, regardless, this would appear to be a proposal that, that staff uh, is almost certainly unlikely to recommend approval of and is recommending denial. Okay, thank you for that information. Um, we will uh, that that's fine for me at this point are there any other um we're gonna 
we're, we're going to open, open this for public comment, comment and I will reserve some time for uh, the applicant to to rebut and um, the, the commission will have time to ask more questions as well if they want. But um, let's go ahead and th think unless I don't hear anything at this point, we'll go ahead and move on to the public comment if that's okay with the commission. Answered my phone on accident. All right. Um, so let's start with. Um, do we start with those in in the room, or do we are we going to go on? How, how many? Let me let me just start with that. Uh, for, for staff, how many um, people do we have that are requesting to speak online? We have two that are registered on the agenda, and at this point, there are no others that have indicated a desire to speak. Okay, so we don't have a lot. And those two are the cards I have in my hand, or those are two that are online? I think they're both there. Okay, great. Then that, uh, uh, Actually, I take it back. Uh, Mark Wright is online. He's the second one listed on the agenda. And you also have Sandra Luedke, who I believe is in person. Yeah, I do have Sandra here in person. Mark, so. Mark Wright is the other person I show, and I have him available to queue up to speak on when you get to that point. All right, let's let's, let's start, start with the in persons, and then we'll queue up after that, so you can be ready for it. Let's um, let's start with Sandra uh, Ludke or. Yeah, if you want to come on up to the mic right here, and uh, glad to have you here. We'll um, there's not not a, a lot of uh, people on this today. We we try to keep these to around three minutes. I won't be super crazy if won't cut you off right on the moment if you're cut me off. no if you're if you're doing a good job. So all right, um, <laughs> my name is Sandra Ledke. I reside at three eight eight one six North Fifteenth Avenue. For over 14 years, my husband and I have called this place home. We have enjoyed the rural lifestyle that has been protected and preserved over the years. And many, even though many new homes have continued to be built up, it's still a neighborhood with a rural touch. And that's because of the ordinances um, and our neighbors that are in place. We know each other, we look out for each other. I own horses and mules, and you can see me out there almost every day riding. Um, my home is directly across the street from the business entrance to Exquisite Stone, Leo Isfahn's granite cutting business. I do not believe Leo lives there. I see him come and go every day. When you do a Google search, you get an address that comes up somewhere over in Tremont. Um, at one time when we spoke with him out in the road, he said that James and him, his son, had bought the place. Um, and that, and I don't know what the case is now because I've never been invited over there, but that his one son was going to live there. One was going to live in the RV, the daughter, I think. I don't know that that's the arrangement now, but that was something that was communicated to us over a year ago. This has been going on for a year and a half. Um, anyway, he doesn't, um, I see him come and go pretty much every day. They've owned the place since December of 2020 and since then have made many changes, several of which violate ordinances, and many of the changes were never permitted. I find that his disregard for laws in my neighborhood does not promote the peace that, that we all move there for, and that is supposed to be you know, promoting the rural lifestyle in that area. I protest this SUP. One shouldn't be able to have exceptions made to the zoning ordinances but rather they should have to cease and desist and move to a location where this type of industrial business is acceptable. It's created a lot of turmoil in the neighborhood. Sorry, my voice changed. <laughs> um, anyway, I never had, I never did see an SUP until the third one, until the third submittal, and that's when Rachel Applegate sent it to me. Um, and that was at the end of April. The last time I heard from Daniel, the representative that we just all heard from, was on January 10th. When he responded to a letter of concern I sent him, after talking to my neighbors, and we are neighbors in that area, um, I think I'm the only one that did get a response. So it's been since January. I know my husband never got a response. Um, since that time, either Daniel or the Isfans have communicated with me. They have never ceased to operate their business, though. I um, 
Well, I had three photos up. They were up when I came up here. Yes. Back, back. Okay, back one. You go. Yes. And I put those up there just as a reference. The first one um, is where they previously were located. And I believe that was 22405 North 23rd Avenue, which is basically a industrial area. It's just north of Deer Valley um, Road on 23rd. And um, that's an aerial view just taken from Google. But you can see that exquisite stone is labeled there. You can see waste management transfer station. You can see a glass shop. You can see several. My husband and I took the time to drive past that um, because if you look up their address, if you look up exquisite stone, that's the address that comes up. So we took the time to drive past there. It was a little scary, you know, um, intense. You'd hate to see my neighborhood begin to look like that. Um, but that's where that's where they previously were located, is my understanding, or that's what Google says. Um, it's the kind of place, though, that you would expect that business to be. And he says, in um, I think on their website, he says that Leo's been in business for 20 years. You can't tell me the person that's been in business for 20 years doesn't know something about ordinances. Um, the second picture in the middle, is a picture taken in December of 2020, just when about the time they purchased it. The outbuilding is that is correct. Uh, Tommy and Lauren were the previous neighbors there, and we knew them. Um, they had that building built, and it was permitted, but did not include utilities. If you take a look at the driveway from 15th Avenue that comes up to that outbuilding, it's I don't know the technical term for it, but it's kind of that rolled rock or granite or something like that. It was not blacktop. Um, as it became. The fence on the west side was a no climb fence, which is a typical horse fencing that you'll find in the neighborhood with shading on it. It's no longer a that type of fence. It's a seven and a half foot block fence on that side. Those were two of the changes. If you look at the third picture then on the right, that's how it that's the most recent area. That fence on the west side is now a block fence. That was one of the first things that was changed after they moved in. The black top, it's kind of hard to see. Not all of that is, some of it's rock, but some of it, because I had to go over and ask them to move a truck for me when they were doing that, um, was black top that was put in. So yes, there are concerns with drainage, permitting, several things um, that took place at that time. The list kind of goes on and on. Once I got that SUP from Rachel on the third one, like I said, that was the first one. It was like, there were so many omissions in the diagram or things that weren't labeled correctly. You can see on the outbuilding at the end, there's a little in the um, right-hand corner, that's where the generator was. And I'm talking about like a hospital size backup generator. You could hear it over my diesel truck. Uh, it was so loud. And so when I, I'd ride by there and you know take pictures, I took video that I included in the report also um, of just how loud that is. Um, on the right hand, and that's omitted in the, in the third SUP, um, any mention of that generator. And one of the things I didn't understand, because I kind of looked through the permitting process and it says that they, um, one of the permits was for a propane tank to operate an existing generator. That's a diesel generator. I'm pretty sure it stinks every time it starts up. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what that is. So I don't know where the propane tank, because that's not on the diagram either in the SUP, where the propane tank is that they got permitted. And I don't know where that generator is. But then again, I've never been invited over there. Yeah. There's a RV on the left-hand side. You know, I don't know what it's used for. I don't know, the air conditioner is going all the time on it. Um, it's got but it's there. Um, it goes on and on. Uh, on the backside, they, they plywooded, put plywood around that generator now. At first it was just open and then they put plywood around it. And I question whether that's a fire hazard or not around the generator. Um, I know that they previously applied for the 400 amp electrical service panel so that they wouldn't have to use the generator. So I don't know how they're operating now without the use of the generator, if that's what they're stating. 
Um, we could wrap it up in like an, another minute or so. That'd be great. It's, it's your, your house, house, so I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you lots of time because we don't have a lot here today and we want to hear um, from you. So The RAD container, the roll-off container is not in the SUP. They, there's no mention of that. And then they've taken wood pallets like I used to store my hay on mm -hmm. and added that to the fence on the south side as I'm not sure why. Um, but these omissions only add to the existing distrust that has been created in the neighborhood. Um, I shared the second picture, the next picture, this, this arrived two weeks ago. If you can change the slide. That's a rental forklift. They've already have forklift on the property, but that's a rental forklift that arrived on June 2nd and was there for about two weeks. And the um, large trucks came and go, came and went through the la throughout the last couple of weeks. And that forklift was in action. And I did send some pictures of that also. Um, I think that when a neighbor feels he is entitled to run his business, despite ordinances and objections from neighbors, demonstrates a total disregard and lack of respect for the law and those neighbors. Not asking for permission from the beginning when you know um, you should is a willful and premeditated act, parallel to a popular belief that it is better to ask for forgiveness rather than permission. This belief leads to a feeling of entitlement and those rules and ordinances do not apply to them. However, those rules and guidelines provide boundaries to keep us safe and live in a community where we know what is expected and therefore promote the peace. This peace has been disrupted. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, any questions for, um, how do you say your last name? Ludke. Ludke Sandra Ludke. Any questions by commission? All right, thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. We'll hear from uh, Charles Philippeck. Come on, come on down. If you just state your name and um, address, that would be great. And um, try to not, you know, uh, in in consideration of all the time, just um, things that may not have been said or presented. Like we'd love to hear your perspective. So. Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm coming across. Mr. Chairman, uh, commissioners, members of planning and zoning. My name is Charles Philippeck. My address is 38816 North 15th Avenue, Desert Hills, Arizona, 85086. And Sandra Lucky is my wife. Okay. Uh, it's been going on about 15 years. One of those types of neighborhoods that you can drop a pin and not and and maybe hear it it's just been a very quiet we have in the past year and a half about uh, a dozen maybe 14 15 brand new dwellings that have gone up in this neighborhood all around the million dollar mark so it's 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 a it's a neighborhood of pride and there's there's just a lot of people that have come there to do what most families do um raise a family uh take care of each other be very proud and earn the retirement for those of us that are retired. I'm representing about 18 retired people there that just couldn't make it here today. And uh, it's just one of those things where you look at uh, why are we going through so much conflict this, at this point in our life? Um, I know this is something you won't see, but uh, my bio is very brief. I spent in the 60s, I spent um, six years in the United States Navy, three years in a combat zone. And after I got out of that, I went into uh, working in financial services, and that's what brought me to Arizona in 1986, where I was made the director of asset management for Discover Financial Services, a job I had for 48 years. Um, I had to deal with a lot of conflict during those days because we were relocating to here. As you know, we have a big facility on I-17 in Beardsley Road, where I had a plan with the county and the governor's office a home for 4,500 employees. To stay uh, devoted to uh, my flag, my country, and my community, I was offered a position as uh, uh, with the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office where I was a lieutenant in the enforcement support posse. So I had uh, that going on in my life at that point. And then I retired from that. And so currently today, I'm the president of the Deer Valley Education Foundation, which is the financial arm of the Deer Valley Unified School District 32,000 families um, and students. So 
I love this community. That's why I do this stuff. And uh, just to look at some of the notes on some of the things that to, to me was kind of like, I'm not going to call it appalling, but it, it may be object to the flagrant disregard of all the, all the, all the things that I think everybody knows. You've seen the 120 page report. Um, I think the biggest concern I had was, was the operation was in full swing. It's, it's, it, it's the noise that attracts you to the situation. And it doesn't matter if the business shuts down at 4 p.m. Everybody's home during the day. So at 4 p.m., uh, which was one of the responses that we received. Uh, also, I was fascinated by the fact that the kids are being dropped off on the intersection of 15th Avenue and Irvine. And uh, the trucks that come in, uh, they have to pass them. There is no schedule for delivery trucks. There is schedule for school buses. And as part of the Deer Valley Education Foundation, I know exactly when those buses show up. And over the last 15 years, we've seen many kids get on that bus and get off that bus. And we see them walking down the street and walking down the street back to their home. The reason being, no sidewalks. I want you to visualize this. There's no sidewalks. So trucks come out and when trucks are going in, and, and my wife loves this, to let you know that I'm here with the delivery, they pull the air horn. Now, if you're on a mule, you're gonna get a nice ride as soon as they hear that going off. And I know that might sound silly, but that's, the, that's, that's part of the nature of the, the concern on, on, on normal life. So it's, it's, uh, the, the last comment was, there was a concern about the weight of the trucks that were coming in. And there's a, like a 300 foot circle. Uh, these trucks are way surpassing that 300 foot because they don't come down from the sky. They have to come up Carefree Highway up 7th Avenue to Irvine. Here comes the trucks, and most of them are coming north. So my guess is that a majority of these uh, trucks and deliveries are coming up 7th Avenue, then west, and then back up on 15th Avenue. So um, it's the noise. It's, it's the conflict. Um, I've dealt with a lot of conflict. I'm 74 years old. I'm tired of dealing with conflict, uh, but I'm ready to trade conflict in for peace, clarity, and insight. And that's the only reason why I'm here. So thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, Mr. Philpeck. Appreciate it. Uh, we have one person online, I believe. Good morning. This is Mark Wright. Good morning. If you'll just state your name and address, try to hold your um, comments to three minutes if you can. Yes, sir. Good morning and thanks in advance for listening to our concerns. My name is Mark Wright. I live at 38710 North 15th Avenue. I am one of the properties that is within 300 feet of the business in question. I purchased my house in October of 2019, kind of my dream home where I planned on retiring. And in respect to everybody's time, I'm not going to repeat all the comments that have been noted already today. However, I want to echo Sandy's comments as well as all the objections, comments noted. As a result of this business, it has significantly diminished me and my neighbor's quality of life. I would hope that everybody takes that into consideration as they make this very difficult decision. I can let you know I have spoken to the owner before to voice my concerns with the generator. That was approximately six to nine months ago. I think it's worthy to note that when I spoke to the owner, he did tell me that he lived north of 27th Avenue and Carefree Highway, which would be Tremonto. In addition, I think it's worthwhile to note that the industrial size generator can be heard while I'm working in my office, in my house, as well as in my bedroom. It's extremely disappointing that the owner chose not to do anything about the noise of the generator until the week before this meeting. I'm extremely disappointed in how the owners handled the neighbor's concerns as well as the quality of life that he's impacted. In conclusion, I'm requesting your consideration to deny the operation of special use permit for this business. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, appreciate that and the conciseness. Um, is there anyone else that's um, here in the room or online that? wishes to speak on this issue. 
Yeah, yeah if, you, if you if you'd like to um, come up and we'll have you fill out a card and you can speak first and then fill out the card. We can do that, right? That's allowed. All right. Okay. If you'll just state your name and yeah, address kind of where. My you're name's at. David Ellis. Uh, I own the property at 1440 West Irvine Road, which is south of the property in question. Uh, I have not filed the letter or a complaint yet, but I am stating that I am opposed to this project. I've had to listen to this generator for over a year now. They have no uh, regard for anybody in the neighborhood. Maybe you would like to hear this. This is what we listen to all day long. That's basically all I have to say. I'm opposed to this project. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then do you, did you get a card for it? If you'll just, you can take it back to your seat with you and fill it out. Just make sure you give it to Rosalie before you leave so she, we have your information. So thank you, appreciate it. Any others at this time? All right, um, we'll go ahead and close public comment. Um, we'll open up for, oh, I did tell the applicant I would give them um, a few minutes to rebut some of the um, issues that have come up. So if the applicant would like to, Take. Um, I'll give five minutes to talk about those issues that have brought up, been brought up, if they would like. Yes, uh, I will actually wanted to know if I can relinquish my time to the owner who is in the audience, and he would like to address and respond if that's if that's allowed and possible. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm totally good with that. If the owner would like okay, to come so up, okay. So the owner yeah. then he can address as far as who lives and all this. Stuff. So I'll let I'll relinquish my time to him. Thank you. Hi, my name is Leon Rispan, and I'm the owner of uh, Exquisite Stone. Um, almost two years ago, we purchased the property, which had a shop on it, and then we did our research in regards to what can be operated on the on behalf of a business, a family business. So, based on that, and then we never had anything specified that we are not allowed to have. Uh, uh, like a granny shop. What I wanted to do is I want to just explain to you how our business is. Our business, it's actually in two categories. Number one is we get, uh, like you see now, a lot of the stuff is made in China and then they deliver through pallets. And then we bring it to our shop. We take it out of the pallets. We put them on our trailers and then we deliver like Daniel mentioned it. The second part, which is a very small part of it, is the fabrication. We only have my son who cuts, and then we have another gentleman that works there, and he fabricates. Fabrication means he polish and he does all that. Before we did any of this work, we made sure before we opened the shop, we made sure that there is no problem with the water, uh, dust, and noise. The problem with the noise was uh, delayed due to the fact that we apply at least several times for uh, for us to get uh, approval for getting more power to the property. The problem we had is due to the fact that Maricopa County, they came several times out, uh, they gave us the okay and then a day before we're supposed to get uh, um, APS to come in and give us the, the power. Uh, they stop us. So in the meantime, we were in a crunch time. Uh, you have to understand the family, it's, um, it's uh, and the business is owned by me, but I work with three sons, my daughter, my son-in-law, and my nephew, and we only have one person that is from outside town. Um, I have very good uh, courteous uh, uh, relationship with my neighbors, the ones that you just talked. I went to their house uh, when we first met. There was no issue at that time. We explained, I explained to them uh, the business that my intentions were, and they had no problem. Uh, I took all the precautionary things. It's like to build a fence. I mean, it's not uncommon. Right now, you drive on 15th Avenue, you drive down on uh, Irvine, you will see fences up and down. It's, it's something common. It's not something uncommon. So I put a fence so it doesn't disturb anybody. Also, I uh, submit myself to the requirements of the Maricopa, which they told me to put another wood fence in front, which I did. All these times that uh, we received complaints, they always came out and they couldn't find anything wrong. 
They couldn't find anything wrong with the noise. They came at least two times or three times, if I'm not mistaken. At one point, even the police uh, was actually called in saying that uh, the plywood that I put to actually block uh, most of the noise uh, from the generator is actually a fire hazard, which wasn't, but the police uh, disregards all that, I mean, also. Another thing is that uh, I've been trying to work through the process to continue. I mean, you have to understand, it's our livelihood. We live off of this. It's, we don't do anything to make anybody angry. We didn't do anything to, you know, take somebody off. We, we did everything that we could. This is how we live. This is our livelihood. And I've been licensed for such a long time. I didn't break any law because I thought, hey, if this one doesn't specify that uh, you cannot have a granite shop here, I mean, I wouldn't have been a blind man to buy the property in the first place. Now I bought it and I upgraded, and I can say that I upgraded up to almost $200,000 I invest in this property. I invested, yes, I put, I put blacktop on it. So there is lesser dust, you know, by driving over. I even put uh, my coat of miners throughout. So there is, when the trucks are uh, driving, there's no dust, you know, raised up. Uh, in the morning, so I'm just trying to go back. In the morning, we load up the trailers. It takes about an hour, an hour and a half. They load it up from 7 to 8, 8.30, the latest. And sometimes we do it in the afternoon, like 3 o'clock to 4, 4.30. And then the first thing they do in the morning, start their truck, they take off. I do the same thing. So um, I know that the concern is, my, my concern is also, uh, that I didn't want it to actually upset any of the customers, I mean, any of my neighbors. Uh, I did everything that I could. I even changed right now, as I said, I have uh, just about two weeks ago, I was able to get a motor that transforms from one phase to three phase. So that, that's doable. So there's no more generator whatsoever. So we won't start it. We actually already put it for sale. Um, the only thing is that if anybody wants to come in a, less than 40 feet from the shop. I mean, we work with the doors closed 95% or 98% of the time. Only when we move the forklift, the door is open. But in reality, we always work with the closed doors. Uh, our walls are very uh, uh, secure in a sense. It has insulation, the doors has insulation. So if you come in 40 feet from, my, from, from the shop, you won't hear a thing. That's been proved by Marico Police two or three times when they showed up. And the thing is, I don't want to upset anybody. The only thing is I want to just to operate my business because the livelihood of my family, my children, which I wanted to leave, uh, uh, you know, all the things that I work for, uh, yes, I wanted to leave it to them. Uh, in regards, I heard that people were saying, well, I was in a different area. It's true. At that point, I was running way bigger operation than right now. So what I tried to do is I tried to cut size because of the economy, economy and the COVID and all that. Um, I cut back and then I said, I'm going to just work with my kids. And that's where I'm at. I'm not here to, you know, blame people that, you know, they don't, they don't approve. But as I said, all their concern is being actually um, addressed. So when you talk about water, we don't discharge any water into any sewer or anywhere. What we do is we recycle take the bags, throw it in the trash. We have a big dumpster that they come and then uh, once a month or depends on what, how soon we need it. Uh, another thing is the pallets that we take the stuff out, they do not sit there permanent. We cut it into pieces, we put it in the trash and it's not something that is being like this, you know, forever and then we pile up garbage and garbage and garbage. Uh, we are actually keeping maintaining our property very clean. I never complain about, you know, my neighbors, you know, mules at midnight when, you know, they start calling and my grandchildren run into their parents, uh, how, I mean, in, in the bed and start scared. What's, what was that? Well, I understand. I moved it. I don't complain about it. I don't complain about the fleas. They are all over. I mean, you can't even stay outside because you get fleas in your mouth because animals, I understand that. I was part of me moving there. Um, I don't think what, I don't know. Um, what did I do wrong at this point to be actually punished in such a way not to be allowed to operate my business due to the fact that I did everything uh, that I knew according to the rules that had been written and I didn't have no uh, sanctions from Maricopa. They would have told me the first time they would come up, hey, you cannot run a business. 
I submit myself, I, I even follow their direction in everything that they request. Building the fence, make sure there is no noise, make sure that there is no dust. Everything I did it according to their recommendation. So right now I want, I don't want it to be denied. If this one is denied, you put my livelihood with the, with my other six children that actually, I mean, it's gonna be a problem. Yeah. I mean, I have 13 grandchildren, they're gonna be, you know, with, without income from one of the parents. And that's what I'm saying, it's, it is difficult. Uh, my son lives in a house. My uh, daughter-in-law with three grandchildren from six to four months, three months, they all live in the house. My daughter and her husband, they do live in the house. It's not something unbearable or something that we disturb people, we don't. You could go anytime, drive by. And then the, third, the lastly, it is in regards to deliveries. Um, there's a lot of comp talk about deliveries. We get a big delivery with the pallets once every two to three months. Okay, that's not every day, it's not every week. Yes, we do sometimes get uh, uh, granite from Arizona tile that comes either with the trailer and we pick it up with our forklift, put it on the on the uh, on the rack, and they they, get, they just leave. And it's not. I know there was a I don't know there was a lot of confusion among the the how much the the trucks are. Uh, I'll tell you the truck, the weight of the truck of a garbage truck that I have to listen every morning when he backs it up into the into the street and pick up people's garbage is as heavy as one of those trucks. It's not bigger than that. So that's all my concern. I mean, uh, with all due respect, I, please do not deny this or reconsider allowing me to operate because that's our livelihood. We're not doing this to, to, to upset anybody. We are doing this just because this is our livelihood. And I, I appreciate your... Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for being here and presenting that. Um, I, um, I do have a couple questions and I think um, others may as well. You know, I, I clearly can see that you've taken steps to try to be a good neighbor with screen walls and pavement and those types of things like that's, I, I can see that. The, the generator I think was a really big issue and I, it sounds like that issue has been fixed. Um, to say, I, I heard you say we've done things to stay quiet, but you have ran a generator like for a long time. Just because you have doesn't mean that, that just because you did something in the past that may have inter, in, bothered someone to me, um, if you're moving forward in a way that works, like I'm more open to that. But I, I do want to just acknowledge that that I, I see that. I think you answered my question as far as who's living in the house. It's your daughter and son and grandkids um, that are actually living in the house. Darren, um, for you, cottage cottage uh, business, just remind, we've had this discussion before, uh, you and I, remind me just what's permitted and not permitted on a cottage. Mr. Uh, Chairman, commissioners, the ordinance has been quite liberalized over recent years. Um, and the, the one significant prerequisite is that the proper proprietor needs to reside on site. If that's documented, they may proceed with a, a special use permit for cottage industry. It's just that it's, it's staff's opinion that the level of this business triggers need for industrial zoning. Okay. And we would not support cottage industry for home-based business. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, any, any other questions, questions by the commission for the applicant? Mr. Uh, Chairman? Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll go, go um, Commissioner McGee and, and then we'll go, go to Commissioner Swart. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, two questions for uh, the applicant. First of all, are, are you attesting here that in fact you do reside on the property? What does that mean that if I live in the property? Yeah, I, uh, uh, for clarity, it's do you do you personally live on the property? I, I understood it to be your daughter and, and son, but yeah, I, I think that's, that's the question. No, I don't live there, but I'm there pretty much 12, 14 hours every day, yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a family member or family members who work in the business who live on the property? Yes, three of them. And then my other question is, you, you said and your architect said, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, you, that you checked, and I'm sure the ordinance didn't spe specify granite production, but what exactly did you check and how did you check through, 
I mean, because I'm, uh, full disclosure, I'm reading Article 501.2 in the Maricopa County Zoning or Ordinances, and I will speak to those in a minute. What did you check? What we check is this, what kind of a business is allowed, and if uh, the people that, sh how many people are allowed to work, and how people from outside, they're not members of the family, are allowed to work. And we also... Uh, came in contact twice with uh, Maricopa County, the person that, uh, I forgot her name, and also the gentleman that retired not long ago. I spoke personally with him. They uh, they encouraged me. I told them what my business is, and I told them, uh, this is what are my steps. And the only thing they told me, they did not tell me that you cannot have that business. He said, for your safety and security so nobody will bother you, it's better to apply for the permit. I said, do I have to stop? They said, no, as far as uh, we are concerned, you're not breaking any rules or any laws in a sense. So you are just uh, do the recommendation, which I did uh, fence the front and try to uh, block the noise from the generator by putting doors up there. Uh, that's all I did at that point. And then uh, we were just waiting at all this time due to the COVID situation, we were just waiting. Uh, so that that was you had conversations with county officials. It, it, nothing was written down. It was just a conversation, and yeah, they. Yeah, it was a conversation over the phone, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Um, Actually, I was driving towards Payson when I was with my daughter and my son-in-law in the car. When we were driving, I pulled over the the side of the road, and we discussed the situation. Yes. And they encouraged me at that time to go ahead and apply for the permit, uh, even though it's expensive. I yeah. said, I will do it just, you know, so it's everybody is on the same uh, page. So I don't want to break any rules or, you know, I'm not here to, you know, jump the horse or do anything else. I was just trying to follow the procedures that they recommend. And thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Isfan. I, I recognize that that was not your intent um, and that we have a number of these types of issues come before us where the property owner is is operating and doesn't realize they are in violation of of the ordinances so it's an after the fact type approval um, and i wanted to circle back mr chairman with county officials is there any record of this conversation or conversations on their end and could they speak to that mr chairman commissioner mcgee there is an open violation uh v2021-00525 due to complaints as early as march and july of 2021 um, and after those notices of violation the applicant came in for a pre-application meeting in august of 2021 uh, was told to obtain a special use permit or cease and desist uh, they did not file that special use permit application until uh, well, they filed that especially select application in October. However, due to lack of progress, the violation case was carried to a hearing six months later in April of 2022. Because we expect a special use permit to process within a six month time frame, um, particularly if there is a, a fire lighted to spur timely compliance due to a violation. So there is a judgment the applicant, the property owner should have received you know, has received this judgment. Uh, they were found responsible for the violation. They're uh, ordered a non-compliance fine of $100 and $100 per day. Uh, but the uh, I believe the daily fines will be dismissed if they obtain compliance either through ceasing and desisting the use or special use permit approval by the Board of Supervisors before August 17th. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have no further questions for Mr. Isfan, but I didn't know if my fellow commissioners did. So I do have some follow-up questions for staff. All right, let's uh, go ahead and see if there's any other for the applicant, and then we can come back to you, Commissioner McGee. I had asked to speak, Mr. Chairman. That's right. Thank you, Commissioner Swart. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I want to just start out by saying I 100% agree with staff uh, far beyond the 32 reasons they gave for denial in this case. 
and I'll just be very candid with you. Uh, I listened carefully to every witness. I listened carefully to the architect and the owner. And for this owner to say that he has this great relationship and he's been nothing but cooperative and conciliatory to these neighborhood is outrageous. And it's shameful and it's not the truth. I listened to these people who talked about their backgrounds and serving our country and the disruption and all the things that this has caused. And if in his mind that believes that he has a great relationship, then uh, I'm in, in, in shock over it. Uh, this is a shameful case. Uh, these folks have worked hard. Uh, they've lived there. They represent many other people. And I'm hoping that uh, my other colleagues will also talk about this case. It, the comment that one of the speakers made, blatant disregard, I think it's beyond that. This is just simply outrageous. And the staff worked very hard to point out to us all of these reasons. This applicant simply says he's never done anything wrong and that he's got this fabulous relationship and it's it's all the county's fault. It's everybody's fault but his own. And to me, I will tell you that when everybody's done speaking, I would like to request that you let me make the motion for a strong denial. I've just, I, I'm just in shock over this case. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Swart. May I respond? Uh, yeah, feel free to. You're here. So. Uh, the uh, the gentleman that you heard, uh, yes, I did, uh, did. He did invite me into his house. I did talk to him. I talked to him afterwards. Uh, we do have a relationship. I don't think that we have any uh, bad blood between ourselves. We salute each other when we see each other. It's not, uh, uh, I mean, to be accused that I... I'm lying that I don't have a relationship. That's kind of odd. I mean, that's the only thing I'm, I want to say. I did talk to the gentleman. He's actually a, a very nice person. I met them both. I went, they invited me to their house and so on and so forth. I went into their house and afterwards we talked several times. Uh, and then we salute each other every time we see each other. So uh, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, thank, thank you. I, and, I, and, I, and I like, like to, to focus, focus more on the use and, and, and whether this is a good fit than get into intentions or um, try to get in your head. I'm not going to try to get in your head on your intentions and why why you do and do, don't do things. But I, I will say, um, you know, when you when we look at this as, at a, as a zoning uh, case, and especially in this case as a special use permit, um, you know, that's what, what I'm looking at is what is the quiet use and enjoyment of the neighbors around you? How are how are they impacting you? How are how are you going to impact them? And that's where I'm making my my decisions. It's not um, if if you've acted in a bad way in the past, and I'm not saying you have, but if you have, and there's a way that we can act in the future that helps you preserve your livelihood, and then then I'm trying to find that way, right, and make it where the neighbors can enjoy their property and you can enjoy your property as well. That's that's where my head is and that's where I'm always trying to move. It's not so much what happened in the past, but is there a way that this can move forward? And so um, I just wanted to say that. Um, is there any other, I, I'll, I'll let the applicant sit down if there's not any other questions for the applicant at this time. All right, thank you. Thank you for presenting. We're gonna go ahead and discuss as a, uh, we'll close public comment and, um, discuss as a as a commission uh commissioner mcgee you had some questions for staff we'll start with you well it's not questions for staff just clarification if we look at our big books and we look at article 501.2.10 um clearly this business does not meet uh, the definition that's outlined of home occupations, cottage industries, and that generated then the need for a special use permit uh, as specified in 601.2.8, um, as I understand it. But when I read both of those sections, there are impossibilities related to the business conforming with the special use or with the cottage industry definition. That's why I was trying to figure out what who Mr. Isfan checked with and why. I know that this commission respects the right of each homeowner and each property owner to use their property um, the way that they intend. And um, I have kind of learned the hard way to do that as well. Uh, but this is 
it goes beyond in terms of reading those two sections, 501.2.10 and 601.2.8, practically every condition is in violation by virtue of the operation of this business, which generated the 32 reasons staff said we cannot recommend approval. Is that an accurate statement, Darren? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner McGee, real quickly, the, the reference in Chapter 5 is the use regulations for the rural zoning districts, and right. Chapter 6 is the use regulations for single-family residential zoning districts. Those are essentially the same, and yes. that's that's for the home-based businesses. If you were within those parameters, you are entitled uh, and entitled to use. Staff determined that the existing operation is not within those parameters. Therefore, they have to get a special use permit, and that's Chapter 13. But, but they won't. They will not then, Mr. Chairman and members, they will not still be in conformance uh, with the things that they need to do uh, to operate this business in a way that respects their neighbors. So, uh, and with all due respect to Commissioner Swart, it is in my district. Um, I would like to make the motion and I would appreciate Mr. Swart's strong second. Yeah, and I'll and I'll just comment real quick, Commissioner McGee. I, you, you know, know, on the SUP, SUP side, it, you know, it's our determination to decide condi conditions and things that that work to, that would make it where this could be a business that conforms with the neighborhoods around it. Unfortunately for me, I do not believe the applicant has been able to establish, um, you know, the burdens on them to show a way in which they can run their business and not impact the neighbors. And unfortunately for me, uh, because I know this does impact this family that I'm sitting here and looking at, um, that that it it they have not done a um, a good enough job in providing um, parameters in which this could be a compatible SUP within the neighborhood. And that's just my personal opinion. I'd so, like any other comments? Uh, yeah, Commissioner Arnett, I see you raising your finger there. Yeah, so so this this actually wasn't as easy for me as it has been for the other commissioners because at the end of the day, the reason they're here is for an SUP. They can have a business, they can do things, but the reason we go through this process is that when it's outside of that um, of what can happen, then they get that SUP and they would be a legal conforming business. Um, I'm sympathetic to the landowner. Um, this is his livelihood and someone lives there. I understand that. Um, I think they, they, it looks like, you know, we can mitigate noise. You've heard me say before that, that frankly, there's other noises much louder than the generator, but this is an industrial generator, right? Uh, you know, whether it's horse trailers and, and uh, hay dump trailers and, and trash and, I mean, so I can get around the noise. I can get around um, a, a lot of things, um, and I'm super sympathetic to this this uh, this homeowner. And and I think they're trying to do everything that they possibly can. However, it feels industrial, right? And and that's where I keep coming back to, because if it was a quieter business. If the deliveries were less frequent, if uh, you know, I, I bet the neighbors probably get hay as much as he probably does his granite. So I, I don't have a problem with any of that. But it's the old adage: if it looks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck, right? So th this feels industrial to me, which is a little out of line. And I've been just going through the aerials. I've been going down the road and Google and all the different things, and it. It, it just feels like it's it's too far. And so that's why I, I just can't support this, uh, but not for all the reasons that, that we're kind of talked about. Quite frankly, I think the homeowner's done a very good job of trying to mitigate all the things. The problem is there's too much industry going on on that residential property for me to support it. So that's where I'm at. Thank you, Commissioner Arnett. And I echo a lot of your comments. I I could have got to a yes, I think, on this with some minor changes in the operations and things, but the way it's been presented, I, I can't get there. Um, I want to get there, I just can't. So, 
Um, any other comments? If not, we'll entertain a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Commissioner McGee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move denial of case Z2021127 per staff recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner McGee. We have a motion um, to support the denial recommendation as presented by staff. Do we have a second? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Swart, go ahead. I'll second the motion. Thank you, Commissioner Swart. We have a second. Um, let's go ahead and uh, do a roll call. Commissioner Lawrence. Approved for denial. Commissioner McGee. Nay. I mean, approved for denial. However, I, I guess would be the denial. Yes, just for yes. clarity. Thank you. I hate these backwards ones. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Commissioner Swart. A strong yes for denial. Commissioner Arnett. I support the motion. Commissioner Hernandez. Yes. Yeah. Commissioner Montoya. I believe the violations are egregious in nature, and so therefore I approve denial. And Chairman Lindblom. Yes. Chairman, that's a denial by a vote of seven to zero. All right, thank you. All right, those are the tough ones for us. Um, let's uh, go ahead and move on to the next. Um, I believe that's all the cases that we've handled. Is there any other um, business by the staff at this time that we need to address? Yep, I didn't think we had any. All right, we'll go ahead and call this meeting. Uh, we'll adjourn this meeting. Thank you all of you for your time, and I apologize for my tardiness. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. See you Thank all. you. Have a good day, all. Thank of you. you. Bye.